Okay, class, welcome back to Awesome. All right, now welcome back to English 2333. <coughs> I'm going to take up of where, excuse me, where we left off um, last week. Last week we talked about an overview of the course or what we're going to be doing. We looked at the course policies and calendar. I also um, went over the syllabus, talked about in broad terms what was going to be happening uh, this semester. Now, <clears throat> I talked about how you're going to earn your grades, etc. Et <clears throat> now, one of the things that I want to do, uh, just to adjust the calendar a little bit, we are going to talk today about a broad overview, uh, kind of a survey of the history of world literature. I'm going to lecture on that from the preface in our text. And then we will finish off today, <coughs> excuse me, with um, some questions I'll have for you in regards to the Jonathan Swift and Gulliver's Travels in our textbook, because we're going to move on into that next week. And then class if you notice, next week also I'll have a lecture where I'll start talking to you about conferences. Conferences will take place the week February 15th or 17th. I'll talk about that next week. I'll give you a heads up for that next week, my next lecture, where we start moving into once again uh, that preparation for your oral presentations. And the conferences are going to be a situation where um, I'll be able to meet with you one-on-one -on -one <clears throat> and uh, I'll discuss what you need to do to prepare. And I'll tell you everything about that class certainly uh, next week or through a lecture next week. And I'll give you all the preparations that we need to have for our conferences. All right, so let's do what we need to do today, class, and that is to talk about, lecture a little bit about the overall of, certainly, of world literature. It tells us, class, that in regards to overall the world literature, it tells us in the preface of our book that Men arrive in boats, men exhausted from years of warfare and travel. As they approach the shore, their leaders spot signs of habitation. Flocks of goats and sheep, smoke rising from dwellings, a natural harbor class permits them to anchor their boats as so that they will be safe from storms. The leader takes an advance team with him. To explore the island, it is a rich in soil and vegetation, and natural springs flows with cool, clear water. With luck, they will be able to replenish their provisions and be on their way. So once again, it's world literature is a going out. Once again, a going out and seeking from almost the beginning of time of literature. And in oral tales class. In the world of these men, welcoming travelers is a sacred custom, sanctioned by the gods themselves. It is also good policy among seafaring people. Someday the roles will be reversed. Today's host may be tomorrow's guest. Okay. So that that seeking out, that traveling, that looking, that we in our own lives do too. Okay. Yet the travelers can never be certain whether particular people will honor their customs, wondering what to expect. <clears throat> the men uh, in some of these books will once again enter into the caves and enter in the coastline. Okay, and so... Class, that's that's the beginning of world literature, that going out, that seeking, that finding, that wondering, 
uh, what what is out there or to conquer and maybe not to conquer to discover to seek the story of hospitality that I was just alluding to which sometimes goes wrong from the Odyssey is one of the best known works in all of world literature we know of this strange encounter of Greek soldiers with the one-eyed Cyclops from Odysseus, the protagonist of the epic. I'm surprisingly, sometimes the locals aren't presented in the best light. Okay. Very good. So, so we deal in that seeking out class. You know, Odysseus's fault <clears throat> that the encounter we see in in the Odyssey that the original encounter with cultures goes very badly. Were he and his companions simply travelers badly in need of food, or were they looters hoping to enrich themselves? The passage suggests in the Odyssey that it's a matter of narrative perspective from whose point the story is told. So that's fantastic. When we get into looking at world literature this semester, <clears throat> when we get into literature, we'll ask ourselves, you know, who's telling the story? Who's telling the story? Whose point? Whose narrative <clears throat> is it? And we see that a lot of times class narratives, you know, differ. Or the story will differ by who's telling it. By who's... Just like history, just like American history, just like world history. It can change sometimes by the narrator's perspective. Scenes of hospitality or the lack there are of everywhere in world literature. Okay, Scenes of hospitality or no hospitality. Hospitality are everywhere in world literature. And questions about hospitality, about the courtesies that we owe to strangers and the strangers owe to us. So we see that playing out even today in daily news. Strangers coming to our land, us going to strange lands, how hospitable we are. Look at look at once again American soul, how how hospitable are we to the migrants or migrants in general or migrations, right? All of us are, all Americans are basically um, <clears throat> immigrants. Immigrants. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me, class. I know I am a first generation. Whether... We are guests or hosts. How to look at that are important today as they were in the in ancient world. Although many writers and thinkers there are fond of saying that our era is the first truly global one, stories such as this episode from Homer's Odyssey remind us that travel, trade, exile, migration, and cultural encounters of all kinds have been features of human experience for thousands of years, yeah, for thousands of years. I was watching the other night that uh, HBO uh, show Game of Thrones, you know, about about the Vikings and about the conquering and the conquests and uh, other people visiting other lands, people visiting their lands. It's been going on for thousands of years, class. People traveling, migration, dealing with language, dealing with food. The experience of reading world literature, too, is a form of travel, a mode of cultural encounter that presents us with the languages, cultural norms, customs, and ideas that may be famil unfamiliar to us, even strange, right? So that's how, that's how we get to travel, class. We get to travel, too. And we get to discover, too, new and interesting and fascinating places that we maybe would never go or maybe will go, but maybe haven't gone yet. But we get to go there through reading and through literature. And what an incredible thing that is. You know, it's like that journey, uh, <clears throat> the 
true journey into college, the true journey to the university. We should always be uh, open or learning new things that we would never discover possibly outside of the university or college or the university can help us once again, can help us further that journey, further to learn new things, right? We're always learning. We will learn new th things once again in the university and the academy by exposing ourselves. As readers, each time we begin to read a new work, we put ourselves in the road. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, class, a few allergies today. In the role of a traveler in a foreign land, trying to understand, trying to understand its practices and values and hoping to feel to some degree and in some way connected and welcome among the people we meet there, right? So, so we're engaging text. We want to be welcome. We want to be exposed. Language, yes. Culture, yes. Different people's ways of lives, yes. Different people's languages, yes. That opening class, fantastic. It's what we do when we read, you know, when we read. When we read literature, when we read text, when we engage in fiction, or when we engage in plays, when we engage in nonfiction, prose, when we engage in poetry, you know, what does it do for us? What are we dropping into? The Epic of Gilgamesh, for example, takes its readers on tour of Uruk, the first large city in human history, in today's Iraq, boasting of its city walls, its buildings and temples, with their stairways and their foundations, right? The Epic of Gilgamesh, all made of clay bricks, like a tour guide, the text even lets its readers inspect the city's clay pits. Over one square mile large, the provided the material for the miraculous city made from clay. The greatest marvel of them all is, of course, the Epic of Gilgamesh itself, which was inscribed on clay tablets. The first monument of literature, right, on clay tablets. So the epic, the story, you know, world literature. In some ways, too part of world literature, the whole scene too can be, uh, in some aspects, old text, the Bible, you know, the stories of the Bible, the Old Testament, the New Testament, fascinating. Part of world literature <clears throat> class, once again, I'm back into it, dabbling it. I like going to the Bible uh, for different reasons, but one of the reasons is to like look at the way the verse, the poems, like say, for example, in the Psalms, look at the way they, they lay on a page, look at the images, look in sometimes in the narrative form of the stories. Why does it work? How sometimes I wonder in scripture how so much can get done narrative story-wise, parable-wise, in very short amount of text. World literature class, fundamental text. From its beginning, the Norton Anthology of World Literature class has been committed to offering students and teachers as many complete or substantially representative texts as possible, right? The fourth edition emphasizes the, found, the importance of <coughs> foundational texts, the actual foundation texts, like building blocks, as never before by offering new translations of some of the best known and most loved works in the history of world literature. All right, the foundational text of world literature. The Epic of Gilgamesh stands first in line of these fundamental texts, which capture the story of an entire people telling them where they came from and who they are. Some foundational texts become an object of worship 
and are deemed sacred, sacred class, while others are reserved as the most consequential story of an entire civilization. Because foundational texts inspire countless retellings as Homer did for the Greek tragedies, these texts are reference points for the entire subsequent history of literature. So we go to the basis. We go to the building blocks for the for the rest of literature. Class. Perhaps no text is more foundational than one which we opened our discussion today, Homer's Odyssey. All right. And in this <clears throat> series in this fourth edition of the Norton Anthology of World Literature. I have a brand new, once again, translation of Homer's Odyssey. All right. So we're seeing where we're going with this class. We're seeing where we're going. And then it talks about expanded selections, a network of stories, and then it, it talk, tells us about cultural context class in regards to this. Odysseus's encounter with the Cyclops speaks not only, once again, going back to the Odyssey class, Homer's Odyssey, speaks not only to hospitality, but also to the theme of cultural contact more generally. The earliest civilizations, those that invented writing and hence literature, sprang up where they did because they were <coughs> located along strategic trading and migration routes. Contact was not just something that happened between fully formed cultures, but something that made these cultures possible in the first place. Okay, So the contact on the trade routes. And the trade routes being exposed to new people, new languages, new culture. Committed to preserving the anthology's riches in a way that conveys this central fact of world literature we have created, it tells us in the book, sections that encompass broad contact zones, areas of intense trade in people's good art and ideas where the earliest literatures emerge and intermingle. One of these is the Mediterranean Sea whose central importance we visualize with four new maps in our book. It was not just a hostile environment that could derail a journey home as it did for Odysseus, or where non-travelers like Peloponnesus might encounter violent invaders willing to attack and steal is also a connecting tissue allowing for intense contact around its harbors. Medieval maps of the Mediterranean pay tribute to this fact. So-called portal and charts show a vertical mesh of lines connecting hundreds of ports. For this edition, we have further emphasized these contact zones, the location of the intense conflict between people. Okay, So it also tells us, class, the importance of cultural contact and encounter is expressed not just in the overall organization of our anthology and the selection of material is also made visible in clusters and text. Four, it lets us know that not all travel was voluntary. People traveled to escape wars. People traveled to escape famine. People traveled to escape plagues and environmental disasters. They were abducted, enslaved, and trafficked. Okay. World literature, abducted, enslaved, and trafficked. We see that still going on today. Still going on today. People, and then that there comes the thing of how do we respond, say for example. How, how does the world respond? How humane is the world? How humane is America? How much can we take in? I don't think there's any like I, firm answers. But we can look at it. We can think about it, class, once again. How much are we responsible for the plight of the world? 
class. They were abducted, enslaved, and trafficked just like today in some aspects of the world still going on. Beginning with the early modern era, European empires dominated global politics, economics, and accelerated the pace, place, the pace of globalization by laying down worldwide trade routes and communication networks, but old empires such as China continued to be influential as well. It still is today, class. We added more uh, material in our anthology talking about the crossroads of empire, including a letter by a chief East African under German colonial control and Mark Twain's trenchant soliloquy of Belgium King Leopold defending his brutal rule in the Congo. Okay, conquest, colonialism, empire, revolution, revolt, world literature, class, world literature. And also tells us in the book there's been an expanded section on poetry and politics, which includes the Polish national poet Adam Mikowicz and Latin American poet Ruben Darius to Roosevelt. Powerful reminder of the crucial role poetry played in the gaining of national independence across the world. Across the world. Poets captured the aspirations of nations and often enshrined those aspirations in national anthems, which also led us to include the Puerto Rican national anthem. One poet included in our anthology wrote not one but two national anthems of both India and Bangladesh. So yeah, it's fantastic what our book contains. Uh, national anthems of India and Bangladesh, yeah. Staying open to the world, staying open to the voices. That's what we're dealing with here. Class, so it enriches us. So we become more knowledgeable. We become more open. We become more cultured of, of the world, right? So, once again, to read is to travel. To read is to travel. To read is to understand. To read is to expose ourselves to new people, new lives. And then hopefully, you know, my hope for all my students too is that, you know, over the years, you get some opportunities to travel to. You most probably already have, but continuing, right? In the same volume, we also enhance our cluster of realism across the globe, which traces one of the most successful global literary movements, one that found express realism, <clears throat> realistic literature. <clears throat> they have more entries here. What's realism once again? The term realism, realistically capturing a place and time and not in fantasy, but realistically what's really happening. France, Britain, Russia, Brazil, Mexico, and Japan. In keeping with our commitment to frequently taught authors, we increased our selection of, once again, Chekhov and Tolstoy's The Death of Ivan Illich in a new acclaimed translation by Peter Carson. All right. <clears throat> so the great Russian, once again, the great Russian writers. Uh, my wife the other night said to me, I don't think... Anybody's better than the Russians, you know. She's a big fan of Dostoevsky, big fan of Tolstoy. <sighs> Class. Worth reading. Worth digesting. The Birth of World Literature. I'm going to try and get through this now. Finish this up and then uh, give you some questions to think about in regards to Jonathan Swift. In 1827, a provincial German writer living in a well, in a small time in the Weimar Republic, recognized that he was in the privileged position of having access not only to European literature, 
but also to literature from further afield, including Persian poetry, Chinese novels, and Sanskrit drama. So this is in 1827, the birth of world literature. The writer was Johann Wolfgang Goethe, or what people call Goethe, right? And in 1827, he coined a term to capture this new force of globalization in literature, and he called it world literature, what we're dealing with. We now include the prologue to Goethe's play Faust, which he wrote after encountering a similar prologue in the classical Sanskrit play, also included in this anthology. Since 1827, for less than 200 years, we have been living in the era of world literature. We're living in the era of world literature. This era has brought many lost masterpieces back to life, including, as we talked about earlier, the Epic of Gilgamesh, which was rediscovered in the 19th century, and the Popol Vuh, which languished in the library until well into the 20th century. Other works of world literature weren't translated and therefore didn't begin to circulate outside of their sphere of origin into the last 200 years, including the epic Tale of Genji, with more literature becoming more widely available than ever before. Guta's version of world literature has become a reality today. So we're when we look at the specter of time or the, the shape of time or the trajectory of time, 200 years isn't that long for world literature. For it to come out or around the globe. And presenting world literature from the dawn of writing to the early 20th century and from oral storytelling to literary experiments of the avant-garde, this anthology raises the question not only of what world literature is, but also the nature of literature itself, right? What is literature? I think the definition is evolving. Evolving. It's not static. It can't be static. It can't be static in form and content. We call attention to the claim changing nature of literature with thematic clusters on literature in the early volumes to give students and teachers access to how early writers from different cultures thought about literature, right? But the changing role and nature of literature are, are visible in the anthology as a whole. Greek tragedy and comedy are experienced by modern students as literary genres encountered in written text but for the ancient Athenians, they were primarily dramas experienced live in the outdoor theater in the context of a religious and civic ritual, right? We go back, we study the Greeks today, 300, 400, 500 years before Christ, right? Because they illuminate for us still today, the Greek dramas. What is man? What is woman? What are men and women? What is their place? What does it mean to be a man or a woman? How can someone have true illumination about their lives? What is meaning in life, class? What is suffering? What is the relation of, once again, humans to the gods? All things that still reverberate to nowadays. Other texts such as the Quran and the Bible. Once again, as I talked about earlier, the Quran and the Bible are sacred pieces of writing central to many people's religious faith. While others appreciate them primarily as or exclusively as literature, right? You can go to the Quran. You can go to the Bible. I like going to the Bible for many reasons, but I also like love going to it for literature. But also, you know, wherever you are in that, I also go there for aspects of faith and hope. Right? It's fantastic. Some texts such as those by Plato or Kant belong in philosophy, 
which crosses over and can cross over to literature, while others, as the Declaration of Independence or primarily political documents, are modern conception of literature as a magic of literature as fiction is very recent, about 200 years old. We have therefore opted for a much expanded conception of literature that includes creation myths, wisdom literature, religious text, philosophy, political writing, fairy tales, in addition to poems, plays, and narrative fiction. Right? Expansive. And I'm right with them on this, with that. It's got to be expansive, right? So, then in, in the hope is, see, you're, you're students of literature too, but some of you may also be writers now, or become writers, or want to write, or are already writing. And then, you know, when you write, the more you read, the more you delve into this wide expansion of literature, and then you can once again take from it and say, you know, I don't have to be narrowly confined. And then that journey continues, right? That journey into what? Writing is. That journey into voice. That journey into becoming who we want to become. Right? As writers. As students of writing. Or writers once again, a writer is just someone who writes. And then what they do with it, it's always up to them. You know, where do they want to take it? What do they want to become? Plus, fairy tales, poems, plays, narrative fiction. The answers to an older definition of literature is writing of high quality, great cultural significance. There are many texts and philosophies, religion. This brings us to the last and perhaps most important question. When we study the world, why study it through literature? All right. Especially when we are faced with so many competing media and art forms. We're constantly bombarded by everything, media and art forms. Why study world literature? Like no other art form or medium, literature offers us, offers us a deep history of human thinking, right? A deep, deep history of human thinking. As our illustration program shows, writing was invented not for the composition of literature, but for much more mundane purposes, such as recording of ownership contracts or astronomical observations. But literature is writing's most glorious byproduct, right? And it helps us once again contemplate, you know, meaning. It helps us contemplate who we are. It helps us contemplate what do we want to become. It helps us contemplate you know, other cultures, other meanings, others' desires. But literature is writing's most glorious byproduct. Literature can be reactivated with each reading, right? With each reading, it's reactivated. So, in essence, you may read a piece of literature one way when you're 20, and then that other piece, that, that piece may be completely different from you or see it from different eyes at 30. Doesn't mean one's better than the other. 18, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. The reactivation of literature. Many of the great architectural monuments of the past are now in ruins. Literature too often has to be excavated as with many classical texts. But once a text has been found or reconstructed, it can be experienced a bit for the first time by new readers, right? Very good. Language shapes our thinking in literature. The highest expression of language, the highest expression of language plays an important role in that process, pushing the boundaries of what we can think and how we think it. This is especially true with great complex and contradictory works <clears throat> that allow us to explore different narrative perspectives and different points of view, right? 
We need that. We need that. We need that. There are many ways of studying other cultures and of understanding the place of our own culture in the world in many ways our culture other cultures where are we in the world archaeologists can show us objects and buildings from the past and speculate through material remains how people in the past ate thought, lived, died, and were buried. Scientists can date layers of soil. Literature, literature is capable of something much more extraordinary. It allows us a glimpse into the imaginative lives, the thoughts and feelings of humans from thousands of years ago or living halfway around the world. This is the true magic of world literature as captured in this anthology we're working with this semester and our shared human inheritance. Excellent. All right, class. So Norton Anthology of World Literature once again on the three volumes of it. So that's a nice little overview of what we're doing, <coughs> where we are, where we're going to move to. And now... One of the things I want to give you, class, is I want to give you some questions for you to think about in regards to Jonathan Swift, where we are this week, and what will be next week, okay, and Gulliver's Travels, and Gulliver's Travels, some questions. So if you can get a pen out and write these down for me, because these are great discussion questions and you'll be thinking about these once again as you're uh, in the midst of your reading in the midst of your studying you can get a journal out and answer some of these questions for me class once again as you contemplate Gulliver's Travels class question number one Ask yourself, class, as you're del diving in, is Gulliver a hero? Is Gulliver a hero? Look that up, class. Dive in on that, okay? Dive in on that. It's a fascinating, broad-ranging question. Is Gulliver a hero, class? Is Gulliver a hero? So that's question number one. Question number two is, is Gulliver, is Gulliver a reliable narrator? Is Gulliver a reliable narrator, class? That's question number two. Is he reliable? Number three, discuss Swift's connection to Gulliver as best as you can. Discuss Swift's, Jonathan Swift's connection to Gulliver. And I'll do some lecturing on this next week too, class, but I want to give you these questions as you continue to read Gulliver's Travels and Jonathan Swift. Number four, what makes the Hunnamans Society ideal or a model for humans number four we're only gonna have five questions class what makes the Hunnamans society ideal or a model for humans ask yourself that take some notes once again in your uh, journals while you're engaging this Notes, 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 class. As you're reading and engaging this material and reading it, and for, finally, five bodily functions are described often and in great detail in the novel. And then this is the question, why is Jonathan Swift so graphic? 
why is Jonathan Swift so graphic? And so ask yourself those questions, class. Remember that um, when I deal with students and their answers, uh, I stay open once again. If you need to uh, review these questions that I just gave you, just go back and you can write them all down. <clears throat> I think I went slow enough, but if you need to go back, questions one through five. And then, class, once again, as you're, you know, as you're reading, um, as you're reading class, hit it. You know, hit it. Answer those questions for me. Keep a notebook. Keep a journal, once again, in regard to the readings and the study you do of literature. And then, once again, when we get things on the page, that's where uh, we can uh, get that illumination of literature. We can get that. We can ask, ask once again, questions of, of the literature. And, and, and uh, I just show you this. This isn't my most current journal, but it's one from, no, I don't know, a couple months ago. And so this one is completed, but I'm just like you once again. When I read, I, I ask questions. I annotate things. I go back and, and, and I look. And, and then I write myself once again. You know, I write myself daily, daily, daily. Once again, trying to, trying to dig in. Trying to uh, uh, figure it out, class. Trying to figure this thing out called life. And trying to figure out, once again, too, if I have a place in literature. Once again, no matter no no matter where it is, you know the ups and downs of, of of me not only being a professor but a writer and just having published my thirteenth book, you know, um, am I exactly where I want to be? Not exactly. Have I entered into the realm? Yeah. Is it good? Yes, it's good. Class, even when sometimes ink splotches hit the page, you know what I mean. It it it's that that contemplation. Once again, the contemplation. Who are we? You know, once again, when we take notes on literature and we study literature, it helps us. It helps us also with the illumination of who we are. And there's no better place uh, for that journey <clears throat> than class, once again, college. It's like a springboard, right? Because... <clears throat> uh, uh, like you all, this started for me once again, a long time ago in college, at the community college too, at my my great co uh, community college that I went to. It was like a springboard, like a springboard, you know. And then and then the springboarding once again continued, you know. It continues. Who are we? What do we want to become? Where where do we want to once again go? How much do we want to dig into life through literature? What do we want from college? What do we want out of college? Once again, what do we want out of literature? What do we want out of our own? Do we want to write? You know, you're your students of writing. If you want to write class, also a lot of times my students will think about that or engage in that. Don't let anybody ever stop you. You be you. You be you. You write. Writers write. Writers certainly write and study. And once again, with world literature, it's expansiveness. Once again, we read the poems, we read the text, we read the stories, we read the plays, we read the speeches for illumination into life. And then once again, for the possibilities to of, of, of what we can become and what we can learn and how we can illuminate our own existence <coughs> well very good <clears throat> so class that's fantastic we covered a lot today be digging into once again um, Jonathan Swift I'll lecture again next week I'll help you with preparations for the conferences but if you're, you're deep into Swift right now and you're thinking about those questions, you're annotating Jonathan Swift and you're thinking about taking notes on the lecture I just did today, 
once again, you'll be in great shape. You'll be in great shape. All right, so until next time, uh, class, I hope you stay safe and well. Good luck in your studies. Stay strong. And uh, we'll leave you, as the Irish always say, good luck, good luck, good luck. And I also hope you have a great weekend during still these challenging times. Take care.